There are some pastors out there that assume, I think incorrectly, but understandably, that everyone in their church understands the gospel. I remember years ago, I was asked to address a group, a large group, but they told me that they were mainly Christians. And they said, well, what are you going to preach on? And I said, well, I thought about preaching on the gospel. And they said, but we just told you that these, most of these people, we know them as very devout and sincere Christians. And I said, well, first of all, I appreciate that, but I can never assume that everyone there is truly Christian or has come to a biblical understanding of the gospel. That's number one. Number two, the gospel is not just for lost people. The gospel is for Christians. And it is about being good. And that's what all religions are about anyway. Be a good person. In that case, everyone will be a bad person. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. It says there's none good because good in God's book means morally perfect. How can sinful man be reconciled to a just God whose justice demands that they be punished? I felt like I was walking on eggshells all the time because it felt as if at any moment I can go to hell because I'm not doing enough. Um, and that's where you see a lot of people who grew up in churches where the gospel might not have been really fleshed out, where they become atheists because it's like, I can't do enough to please him anyway, so why, why trust him? Why believe in him? Um, I'm still the same person. I'm still wicked. I'm still sinful. In that case, everyone will be a bad person. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. It says there's none good because good in God's book means morally perfect. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty. By the guidelines, I'm going to be guilty. Heaven or hell? I'm assuming hell. So how do you fix the broken part of the human heart that loves the wrong things? The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 verse 1 immediately comes to mind. To be dead in sin means that we are physically alive, but that we are morally unable to respond to God. What can a dead man do? And the gospel not only addresses my behavior, my actions, it addresses who I am by promising to change me at the core basic level of personhood. Therefore, God must perform a resurrection. So if all we did say to people is, be good, the other human response is, wait, what does it mean to be good? Does it mean to be as holy as God is holy? Never lie, never be selfish, never in any way do things that are contrary to God's law? Oh my, I'm, I'm in despair now. What you're doing is you're revealing in the hearts of your people their shortcomings and failures. So to just leave it in their hands and their effort puts a weight on them they can't bear up under. Well, what if I have failed sexually? If I'm a, a man sitting in the church service at that moment, I have no hope as I walk out. I'm just told, here's 10 ways that you should try harder. We're damning people to those twin possibilities of pride on the one hand or despair on the other. And this is why the gospel is so important, because the gospel comes in in the middle of both of those. How can sinful man be reconciled to a just God whose justice demands that they be punished. Do you know what God did for guilty sinners so he wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? The answer is found in the person of Jesus Christ, the historical person, God intervening into human history. And this Jesus of Nazareth lived the perfect life that you and I could never live, have never lived. And then he goes to a cross. We owed a debt to God because of our sin. And that debt was suffering eternal punishment but on the cross, God Himself, He took our place, bore our sin, and suffered the wrath of God that we deserve. He extinguished it. He put it away. And on the third day, He rose again from the dead. 
Then he ascended up into heaven and this Jesus, the Son of God, sat down at the right hand of God. And now the Bible teaches that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except through Him, that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if you repent and trust alone in Jesus as your Savior, God will remit your sins, dismiss your case, and grant you the everlasting life as a gift, not because you're good, but because He's rich in mercy. In many ways, the defining doctrine of true biblical Christianity is justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Justification is God declaring us righteous even though we are guilty of sin. We see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works so that no man may boast. And so this is the great dividing line between biblical Christianity during the Reformation and the Roman Catholic religion. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church on justification is that they believe that you are justified by faith plus works. In fact, at the Council of Trent, which people refer to as the Counter-Reformation, they actually issued an anathema. If anybody believes that they are justified by faith alone, they are condemned under the anathema of the Council of Trent. And so the Roman Catholic Church actively was opposing and cursing those who were holding a biblical gospel. It is often called the plus religion because Catholicism teaches that you are saved by faith plus works, by grace plus merit, by Christ plus other mediators, according to scripture plus tradition, and for the glory of God as well as the glory of Mary and other saints. When you look at the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, it is a salvation of works and sacraments. In the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, Baptism cleanses an infant from original sin. And that is the sacrament of regeneration as well as justification. That it starts them off on this plan, on this track. Along the way, however, they can commit these small sins, venial sins, which plunges them back down. And heaven forbid they commit a mortal sin, which knocks them completely off the plan of salvation. And he must now receive sacraments. He must confess his sins to a priest, which is the sacrament of penance. And then he must be re-justified by doing good works, by doing penance. And once he is re-justified, then he must maintain his salvation through sacraments. And if, in the end, if they have enough people praying for them, and if they do enough time in purgatory, they might possibly get to heaven. How they get to heaven is based on what they do rather than what Christ has done. But the Bible teaches there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the work has been done. He saves you totally, completely, perfectly. And even though, yes, we sin and can repent, the sacrifice of Christ has paid for those sins. And so there is assurance that He has saved you, He has plucked you out of the world, you're in the palm of His hand, and nobody can pluck you out of His hand. And so that's why the Reformers cried the five solas, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church on justification is that they believe that you are justified by faith plus works. In fact, at the Council of Trent, which people refer to as the Counter-Reformation, they actually issued an anathema. If anybody believes that they are justified by faith alone, they are condemned under the anathema of the Council of Trent. And so the Roman Catholic Church actively was opposing and cursing those who were holding a biblical gospel. It is often called the plus religion because Catholicism teaches that you are saved by faith plus works, by grace plus merit, by Christ plus other mediators, according to scripture plus tradition, 
and for the glory of God as well as the glory of Mary and other saints. When you look at the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, it is a salvation of works and sacraments. The Roman Catholic plan of salvation, it is a salvation of works and sacraments. In the Roman Catholic plan of salvation, baptism cleanses an infant from original sin. And that is the sacrament of regeneration as well as justification. That it starts them off on this plan, on this track. Along the way, however, they can commit these small sins, venial sins, which plunges them back down. And heaven forbid they commit a mortal sin, which knocks them completely off the plan of salvation. And he must now receive sacraments. He must confess his sins to a priest, which is the sacrament of penance. And then he must be re-justified by doing good works, by doing penance. And once he is re-justified, then he must maintain his salvation through sacraments. And if, in the end, if they have enough people praying for them, and if they do enough time in purgatory, they might possibly get to heaven. How they get to heaven is based on what they do rather than what Christ has done. But the Bible teaches there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the work has been done. He saves you totally, completely, perfectly. And even though, yes, we sin and can repent, the sacrifice of Christ has paid for those sins. And so there is assurance that he has saved you, he has plucked you out of the world, you're in the palm of his hand, and nobody can pluck you out of his hand. And so that's why the reformers cried the five solas, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. five solas, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. That message has always found opposition. And the Jerusalem Council, and we read about it in the book of Acts, actually addressed this very same issue. The rabbis and the Judaizers were saying to the Christians that God will accept you by His grace, through faith, and your keeping of the ceremonial laws. Being circumcised, washing your hands, keeping the food laws. And the entire church agreed, as summarized by uh, the Apostle Peter's statement, that that is not the good news. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't come to make salvation possible for those who do their part. He came to accomplish it and to give it freely to all of his people. The question is, well, how do we know if faith is real if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit. That your faith alone in Jesus, that is what saves. And then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart produces fruit, the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God by grace through faith in Christ. And the entire church agreed, as summarized by uh, the Apostle Peter's statement, that that is not the good news. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't come to make salvation possible for those who do their part. He came to accomplish it and to give it freely to all of his people. 
The question is, well, how do we know if faith is real if there's no works? Doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? And so don't we have to do works to be saved? Isn't that the argument? Is that what we have to be doing? But there's two understandings of that, and one's biblical, one's not. So the Roman Catholic view of salvation, and really any works-based system of salvation, takes works and puts it at the root and says that works plus your faith in Jesus is what produces salvation. But the Bible teaches that it's not the root, it's actually the fruit. That your faith alone in Jesus, that is what saves. And then a, a life that has been saved, a sanctified, regenerated heart, produces fruit, the fruit of good works. And so you know a person's been saved because of their fruit, but the fruit is not the reason they're saved. They're saved by God by grace through faith in Christ. You see, the Christian is the only person, the true Christian, who can say that they're going to heaven without being self-righteous. Why? In other religions, how do you get to heaven? You get to heaven by being good, by earning it. In Christianity, you're not reconciled to God through your own virtue or merit, but you're reconciled to God through the virtue and merit of His Son. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. So, Augusto, if you were to die today, how old are you? 19. If you were to die at 19 and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved. You've got to repent and trust in Christ. When are you going to do that? Almost immediately. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Euangelion, the Greek word gospel, is taken from the good news that a runner would bring as a messenger coming to announce in the capital that victory had been achieved on the battlefield. And everyone would cheer. It would transform the lives of everybody in the city to know that they hadn't lost the war, they had won the war. But of course, they weren't the ones out there in, in, in the trenches. In the same way, Jesus says, I have accomplished salvation, not come help me, save the world, but I have accomplished this. The law basically is do. The gospel basically is done. The gospel isn't what would Jesus do, now go and do that. The gospel is what has Jesus done, now believe that. This distinction between the law and the gospel really is the most important thing to remember, and it's one of the things that we're forgetting that pattern of God always making sure that we know that relationship comes before obedience, that we do not have a relationship with Him because we obey, we obey because He has made a relationship with us. That is made clear over and over again in the Bible. God says before He ever tells His people what the commands are, I'm the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, now obey me. Now, it's critical we understand he didn't say, you obey me and I'll let you out of Egypt. No, he said, I have redeemed you. Now here's the safe path for you to walk on. It's the order not just of the Old Testament passages. I mean, all the epistles of the New Testament basically follow that same order. In general, the first half of the epistles of Paul, of John, of Peter kind of say, here's what God has done in Christ. Here's how he has saved you. The last half of the epistles, now here's what you should do in response. 
The moral commands that we should obey are like the railroad tracks for the train, that as the train's going, this is the way that the train's supposed to go. But the gospel is the engine and the fuel that makes the train actually move. And so it does a Christian no good and it does a non-Christian no good to just continue telling them, hey, here's the tracks, now go. But if they have no fuel, if they have no engine, they're just gonna be a train stuck. And there's a lot of Christians, I think, today that are just trains sitting on tracks, being told, go forward, but they're not being given an engine or any fuel to move them forward. There are some pastors out there that assume, I think incorrectly, but understandably, that everyone in their church understands the gospel. I remember years ago, I was asked to address a group, a large group, but they told me that they were mainly Christians. And they said, well, what are you going to preach on? And I said, well, I thought about preaching on the gospel. And they said, but we just told you that these, most of these people, we know them as very devout and sincere Christians. And I said, well, first of all, I appreciate that, but I can never assume that everyone there is truly Christian or has come to a biblical understanding of the gospel. That's number one. Number two, the gospel is not just for lost people. The gospel is for Christians. God being three in one, eternally existing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, in His great love, He he made creation to share his love with. Um, not that he needed to, but he wanted to. And in that, he created us. And in creating us, we fell into sin. And sin is something that separates us from God. It's something that is not of God. It's something that's against God. On Saturday nights during the um, summer, we host worship nights at our house, usually starting at about 6.30. You know, we'll play basketball, we'll throw the football frisbee around, and we'll just talk and hang out outside. Um, and then we'll gather in the living room and there'll be a time of worship. In our community, we've made it a practice that every week we try to have meetings where the, the gospel is at least presented one time. And Jesus being fully man, fully God, walked on this earth and lived a life without sin, without blemish. Um, and live the life that we were called to live and live the life that we should have lived. And in our place, He died the death that we deserve. Three days later, He rose again after that death on the cross. And one of the things we do stress is that even believers need it, even people that hear it a hundred times a month still need that. We do have hope because any kind of judgment um, from that sin has been dealt with by God. The gospel is not something that you graduate from. It's not something that you ever move on from. The gospel is central. We're constantly prone to forget the gospel. We're prone to forget uh, who he is, who we're not, what he did for us. Preaching the gospel all the time, every week, means that from Genesis to Revelation, you realize the whole Bible is one unfolding story of God's love and saving grace and mercy towards sinners in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that the whole Bible is about him. And Luke records for us that Jesus taught them all the things concerning himself from the law, the prophets, and the writings, which were the threefold way of describing the whole Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. And the whole Bible is about Jesus. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to follow Jesus' understanding of the Old Testament. Therefore, if we explain any text in isolation from him, we fail to say the very thing that he said it's about. He said it's about him. If you're preaching about Daniel and it's dare to be a Daniel, it's not about Jesus. If you're preaching the book of Revelation and it's about Israel and Russia, then it's not about Jesus. Though Jesus isn't the content of the whole Bible, he's the center of it all. In other words, not every story, every little thing is about Jesus or can be an analogy for him, and yet it all points towards Him and His work. He's the pinnacle. So the message of the Bible is that God will save His people. 
So any point you drop into Habakkuk or 2 Timothy, you know, any point you drop into Isaiah or Deuteronomy, it's going to be connected somehow to this main trunk road of the good news of what God is doing in our world. Whether you start in Genesis 3 and you talk about God making a promise that he would crush the serpent through the seed of the woman, well, what's the rest of the book of Genesis? It's the story of that seed through the woman. And that's why so many people get bogged down by genealogies and they're like, what are these genealogies about? This is why the New Testament opens with a genealogy and showing you that the seed has come in the person of Jesus. And so if you can't see the cross in the story of Joseph telling you what you meant for evil, God meant for good, I mean, that's the cross right there in a metaphor. Well, then you're, you're really missing the whole unity of the Bible. And I think that's probably, if you wanted to put it, what we're denying, what's one of our problems. It's that we're missing that the Bible was written by one author and that therefore the author has a unified story that he's telling. Even though there's different human authors, they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit.